Welcome to the Conway Hall Ethical Society series of talks. Uh, the Conway Hall Ethical Society is the oldest surviving free thought organisation in the world and it is the only remaining ethical society left in the United Kingdom. Um, the origins of the society trace back to the late 18th century, so it's very old, very distinguished. And today we're incredibly lucky to have a philosopher, John Sellers, talking to us. He's written many books, um, a lot of them seem to have been about Stoicism. Today he'll be switching to the Greek philosopher Epicurus, and the way we use the word Epicurean may make you think that we're just going to talk about decadent self-indulgence, but in fact it's an awful lot more complicated than that. I think John's going to give us a more nuanced version. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about the Greek philosopher Epicurus and what we might be able to learn from him today. And as Deborah said in the introduction, um, I've worked mainly on another ancient Greek philosophy, Stoicism, um, over the years. And the Stoics and the Epicureans were contemporaries in ancient Athens. Um, so one question that people might ask, people that are familiar with things that I've done in the past is why Epicurus, why have I turned to Epicurus on this occasion? And um, so I just wanted to, to make a quick comment on this, a, a kind of personal comment, if you like. Why Epicurus? But in particular, why Epicurus for me? Um, and I suppose it began well, when I was first studying philosophy, probably it's going to be the early 90s, so almost 30 years ago. And I came across by chance um, a copy of Lucretius, um, the great Epicurean poet who writes his book on the nature of things or on the nature of the universe. And I read this book alongside um, another uh, Penguin classic that I bought at the same time, The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, the famous Stoic. And these two books really spoke to me. I found them both really, really interesting at the time. And as things have gone on, I've ended up working much more on Stoicism. But that love of Lucretius, from an early stage in my um, uh, uh, philosophical career, if you like, has really stuck with me. So I've always had a soft spot for the Epicureans. And another reason is, although I ended up focusing my own work more on Stoicism, there were always a few things about Stoicism, particularly when I first encountered it, that I wasn't entirely comfortable with. So for instance, the Stoics are um, pantheists, they believe in a god which they identify with nature and they think that this god providentially orders nature and everything is for the best and that this is the best of all possible worlds and those certainly weren't beliefs that I particularly um, chimed with and I've kind of um, thought of interesting ways in which we might be able to reinterpret those um, as I've worked on Stoicism over the years but at first glance the Epicurean approach to understanding nature seemed much more in tune with where I was than with the Stoic approach. And similarly, the Stoics talk a lot about virtue and the importance of acting virtuously. And again, my earlier um, teenage self wasn't necessarily inspired by ideas of virtue um, at that point, whereas the Epicurean approach seemed much more in tune with where I was. Um, and where was I? I mean, I think I would have described myself as a sort of enlightenment atheist in many ways, wanting to try to um, escape from outmoded superstitious beliefs um, and, and to think much more like a free thinker if we like. And so for all these reasons, um, Epicurus and Epicureanism connected with me from the very beginning. So I'm really pleased to finally have the chance to, to write something about Epicureanism uh, now. So, who was Epicurus? Let me just say a little bit about who we're dealing with. So um, Epicurus, his parents were Athenians. Um, they settled on one of the Greek islands. He was born and brought up there. Um, and he moved around a number of, of different Greek islands. He lived on the island of Lesbos for a while, um, met some friends along the way, started to teach philosophy. And then at a certain point, he and his friends all moved to Athens to the ancestral home of his family, even if he'd not um, lived there as a child. 
And there he sets up his philosophy school. Um, he buys a patch of land just outside the walls of uh, the city of Athens. And this patch of land becomes known as the garden and Epicurus and a group of, of fellow philosophers live together within this garden in uh, uh, an, an enclosed community. You might imagine it as a kind of a secular monastery where they live together and try to follow the principles of Epicurean philosophy. So Epicurus himself starts the whole thing off and we're talking around 300 BC, that kind of time. And this garden community that he develops just outside the walls of Athens, it flourishes for a good couple of centuries. So roughly from around 300 BC down to the, the early part of the first century BC, we should say. And at that point, I think it's probably, uh, it's probably destroyed. So Epicurean philosophy flourishes in ancient Greece and in Athens in particular. By the first century BC, um, obviously the Romans are on the scene and we start to see a number of uh, Romans take up Epicurean ideas. And this is where Lucretius comes in. So we don't know anything about Lucretius as an individual. We, we've literally just got the name. We've got almost no biographical information, but we've got this incredible poem that he writes, De Rerum Natura, On the Nature of Things, in which he writes in Latin verse, an account of Epicurean philosophy. And fragments of a masterwork by Epicurus called On Nature have um, been recovered and um, kind of scholarly analysis has shown that um, what Lucretius writes in his Latin poem follows very closely the contents and the order of that lost work by Epicurus. So we can be confident, I think, that what Luc Lucretius presents in his great poem is an accurate account of what Epicurus himself would have thought. So that's the really long, important Epicurean text that's been influential, particularly in the early modern period. And then a third Epicurean that I want to mention briefly is um, uh, a chap called Philodemus. Philodemus was also around in the first century BC, around the same time as Lucretius. They may have even known each other, although we don't know for sure. Both are likely to have been alive and active in the Bay of Naples area in the first century BC. Philodemus was originally from a city called Gadara in the, the Middle East, um, modern day Jordan. Um, he traveled to Athens, studied in Athens at the Epicurean Garden, um, and then came over to Italy and settled in, in the Bay of Na the, the Bay of Naples um, area. So that so Epicurus, Lucretius, Philodemus are kind of the key figures, and we've we've got text for all of them that we can we can read today. Now I just mentioned Philodemus. Um, we've got a number of texts of his that survive, and there's one in particular that I want to mention, um, and it's known as the Tetrapharmakos, the fourfold cure or the fourfold remedy, which. Um, we took as the title for um, my short book on this material. Um, it was discovered in a papyrus fragment um, that was buried in a villa in Herculaneum, not far from Pompeii, buried in the same eruption of Mount Vesuvius that, that buried Pompeii. And a number of papyrus scrolls were carbonized in that um, eruption and have been excavated and deciphered. And um, the image that you can see on the slide there is in fact a pencil drawing of the text that was seen when someone unrolled one of these papyrus scrolls. And not long after they'd managed to transcribe this text, the, the scroll literally crumbled into, into pieces um, because it was so fragile. So all we've got left is this early 19th century pencil drawing preserving these few letters of Greek. And what it gives us is this short text, the Tetrapharmakos, the fourfold cure. And as you can see, it says, don't fear God, don't worry about death. What's good is easy to get and what's terrible is easy to endure. And this Philodemus presents as a very short, memorable 
summary of some of the key ideas in Epicurean philosophy. And we'll, we'll come back to some of these in a moment. Don't fear God. Don't be anxious about divine punishment. Don't worry about death. What you need in order to live a good life is very easy to get and, and difficulties you can, you can cope with easily enough. And Epicurus thinks that these are some of the things that concern people most. These are the sorts of things that keep people awake at night. And so these are the sorts of things that we need some kind of remedy for if we want to live a good life. Um, you can see immediately that what he's talking about here are different forms of what we might call today psychological anxiety. It's different anxieties about things that might happen to us in the future that he seems to be most concerned about here. And I'll come back to that thought later on as well. Um, we might not be particularly concerned about fear of a, a vengeful God um, at the moment, but I take it that fear about death is something that um, can be a significant concern for people still today. Now, central to the Epicurean approach is the idea that if we want to avoid these sorts of anxieties, we need to understand how the world works. Um, a core theme in Epicurean philosophy is the idea that superstitions cause anxieties. Superstitions are, such as a belief in a vengeful God that might punish us if we don't do the right thing. Um, these are the sorts of things that can disturb people or certainly disturb people in the ancient world, according to Epicurus. Um, and the only way that we can overcome those sorts of anxieties is to really understand how the world works. We need to do physics. We need to try to understand nature. And this is what we see played out at great length in Lucretius's poem on the nature of things, where he goes through a scientific, naturalistic, materialist account of absolutely everything, of how the universe was formed, how the earth was created, how early humans lived and developed, how civilization developed, um, how our minds and bodies work, how we perceive things. Everything you could possibly want explained is laid out there for us um, uh, according to the principles of atomism, which was the, um, the type of materialist philosophy that the Epicureans subscribed to. So they claim following an earlier Greek philosopher, um, Democritus, that everything that exists in the world is made up of tiny little atoms that float around within an, inf within an infinite void. They bang into one another, they glue together and make larger aggregates, which are the objects that we can see in the physical world. There's no order to this. There's no design. There's no divine mind um, orchestrating the whole thing. It's just these little bits of dead matter floating around, banging into each other. Everything that we know, everything that we experience is just the contingent product of these atomistic interactions. And Epicurus thinks that if we can understand nature in those terms, then we'll be able to escape all those sorts of superstitious beliefs that might otherwise disturb us. Okay, so that very briefly about um, the physics, I don't say a huge amount about the physics, I want to move on and focus really on Epicurean ethics, which is, if you like, uh, our main topic for today. And as Deborah said at the, uh, in the introduction, when we hear the word Epicurean today, we tend to think of someone who enjoys fine food and wine and that kind of physical indulgence. Um, and that image of hedonism, of hedonistic enjoyment of physical pleasures is by no mean a new one. We find that in antiquity. In fact, we find a group of hedonistic philosophers, um, the Cyrenaics, who believed precisely that what we ought to do is maximize 
our pleasure, in particular, maximize physical pleasure. This is the route to a good life. So wine, women and song, decadent excess. This is what you should do if you want to live well. That was the Cyrenaic view of hedonism in antiquity. And they're around a little bit before Epicurus. And when Epicurus comes along, he also wants to champion, champion hedonism. He also wants to suggest that it's pleasure that's the key to living a good life. But he wants to present hedonism in very different terms. He wants to propose a very simple life of modest pleasures in which it's not about more and more and more and enjoyment to excess. And in order for him to present this more nuanced and sophisticated account of hedonism, he's going to need to make some important distinctions between different types of pleasure. And that's what I want to, um, to talk about now. So the first really important distinction that he draws is between what we might call active pleasures and static pleasures. Um, in the Greek, the active pleasures are the kinetic pleasures, the move, moving pleasures, if you like, and the static pleasures are called catastimatic. We don't need to worry about the technical terms. So to illustrate this for you very easily, um, an active pleasure would be something like eating, right? Um, the pleasure that you get when you're in the process of eating, you enjoy that, you get something from that. And that's what the, the Cyrenaic hedonists the, um, uh, uh, would have thought pleasure is, right? And if we think about that popular image of hedonism, we're thinking of active pleasure like eating or drinking. What Epicurus wants to say is that there's another type of pleasure, static pleasure, and an example of a static pleasure would be the contentment you feel when you've finished eating and you're no longer hungry. And Epicurus thinks that that's what we're really after. When we eat food, we might enjoy the process of eating food, but that's not why we're eating food. We're not eating it in order to enjoy the process, in order to enjoy the process. We're eating it in order not to be hungry. We're eating in order to reach that state of contentment when we've had enough. And when we've had enough, we won't need any more. So it's not as if you enjoy the process of eating and you just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat until you explode, right? Or it certainly ought not to be like that. You eat and you enjoy the process. You then reach this state of static pleasure when you're no longer hungry and you're content and you don't eat any more. And if you did eat more, rather than increase your pleasure, you would start to generate pain. You'd start to have indigestion. You would, it would be a counterproductive process. So the thought is that once you reach that state of not being hungry, more and more and more won't add anything extra to the quality of the pleasure that you're experiencing. And so there's a really important distinction at work here that's worth stressing, I think. Um, the first is that that active pleasure of eating is something quantitative, right? It can increase and increase. But the static pleasure, the contentment of not being hungry, that's a qualitative state. And once you've reached that qualitative state, you can't improve it or increase it by adding any more. And that's the type of pleasure that Epicurus thought we ought to aim at a state of contentment in which you don't need any more. So that's the first really big distinction. And there's another quick um, footnote I should add to this as well, which is Epicurus thinks that pleasure is effectively the same 
as or the, this this state of, of static pleasure i should say is effectively the same as not being in pain so not being hungry it, we we might take as an ex, an instance of not being in pain epicurus doesn't think that there's any kind of neutral state between pleasure or pain if you're experiencing pleasure you're not in pain simply not being in pain is itself an instance of pleasure there's never a point in which you're not really feeling anything at all and you're just neutral and so again the goal is not more and more pleasure more and more food and drink the goal is to not be in pain that's really what we're all after and so i hope you can see that in those two different ways you end up with an image of a pleasant life that's very very different from the the modern notion of hedonism in which you just have more and more and more pleasure um, um, without limit there's a very clear limit here okay so that's the first distinction that epicurus wants to make in order to show how his version of a life of pleasure is quite different from the decadent um, hedonism of the, the Cyrenaics who were around um, uh, just before him. The second distinction he wants to make as well is between um, physical pleasures and what we might call psychological pleasures. So I've been talking about eating and not being hungry. Obviously, that's just um, 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 a physical pleasure. And um, Epicurus wants to draw, I can um, draw a distinction between physical pleasures on the one hand and psychological pleasures on the other. And what he wants to suggest is that, in fact, the quality of our lives is determined by psychological pleasures much more than physical pleasures. And it's the psychological pleasures that really shape our lives. And so, Picking up on the comment that I was making a moment ago about the goal really being to reach a state of not being in pain, not being in hungry. Similarly, when it comes to psychological pleasures, the goal is to reach a state of not being in psychological pain, to not be anxious to not be worried. The goal ultimately is to reach a state of psychological contentment rather than enjoying active physical pleasures like more food, more drink. So that adds a, another, another way in which Epicurus's hedonism will differ from that Cyrenaic hedonism. The goal is psychological tranquility, a static psychological state of no longer being worried about anything at all. That's the goal of the Epicurean life. And in order to help us get to that goal, another thing that Epicurus does is he does an analysis of the sorts of things that we tend to pursue the sorts of things that we desire. And he says that if we can stop and reflect and think about the things that we um, pursue in life, that will enable us to reach this state of psychological contentment or tranquility that he thinks is the key to living a good life. And so he says, whatever it is that you might pursue that you might think you need, um, it's going to fall into one of three categories. It's either going to be something that's natural and necessary, natural but unnecessary, or simply unnatural and unnecessary. So what would be examples of these? Well, natural and necessary would be anything that you need in order to survive. So food, water, shelter, these sorts of things, right? The basics of life, that's what you need in order to live. They're perfectly natural desires and we need them. Often, of course, 
we don't just pursue the bare basics, but we pursue more fancy, refined versions of them. We don't just want food so that we don't starve. We want nice food. We want variety. We want a nice glass of wine with our meals. We don't just want shelter from the rain, but we want a nice house in a nice part of town. We don't just want clothes to keep us warm. We want nice fancy clothes from um, expensive shops. And Epicurus is going to put all of those sorts of things into the second category of natural but unnecessary. So our desire for these things arises out of a perfectly natural need, but we go beyond what's merely necessary and, and try to secure something that isn't really required. We could get by without those things. And then into the third category goes literally everything else. All that stuff that doesn't actually satisfy a natural need that you have at all. All the other paraphernalia of modern life that we all um, often pursue. But ultimately, we don't really need any of it at all. It's unnatural. Um, or our desire for it doesn't fulfill a natural need, we might say. And it's all completely unnecessary. So Epicurus thinks if we can do this kind of analysis of the different things that we um, pursue, we um, will realize that much of the stuff that we think we need in order to live a good, happy, pleasant life is in fact unnecessary and we could do without it. And Epicurus thinks that in fact, the stuff that we really need, the natural and necessary stuff is surprisingly easy to secure. Um, you can you can survive on re a relatively small income he would he would say right the the basics aren't that expensive and he thinks and this is the key point he thinks that if we can come to see that if we can come to realize that what we really need is actually very little and very easy to get hold of that's going to massively reduce our anxiety about the future Many of our anxieties and concerns, he thinks, are about our ability to fulfill our needs in the future, worrying about whether we've got enough money, worrying about our jobs, worrying about all of those sorts of things. All of that is ultimately anxiety about whether we can secure what we need in the future. And if we can come to realize that what we need is actually very little and very easy to get hold of, then that will massively reduce that anxiety. And that's obviously central for Epicurus because he thinks that it's psychological tranquility that's the key to living a good life. Okay, so I think, although this is not quite explicit, I think one of the things that comes through from all of this is the thought that we ought to focus our attention very much on the present moment. M many of our anxieties and concerns are focused in some way on the future and we ought not to be so worried about the future. We ought to spend a lot less time thinking about the future, he suggests. Um, that's one thought. And instead of constantly being anxious about the future and what that may or may not bring, he thinks instead we ought to focus our attention on reaching this state of static psychological pleasure uh, uh, in the here and now. So the idea, if you like, is contentment and tranquility in the present moment. And he thinks that this comes from living a very simple, modest life, as I was saying at the beginning. He often describes his own hedonistic lifestyle as bread and water and occasionally if he wants to treat himself and um, perhaps a small pot of cheese. So a very, very modest um, lifestyle. Um, and of course, there's no reason in principle based on the, the terms of his philosophy why he couldn't enjoy a much more decadent life. He couldn't enjoy all sorts of fancy foods and meals and all the other um, pleasures that life brings. And of course, he thinks that those pleasures would be genuinely good things. 
I take it Epicurus would want to warn us against slipping into that kind of hedonistic lifestyle, because once we start to get a taste for those kinds of physical pleasures, um, the risk is that we'll start to expect them. And if we start to expect them, then when we don't get them, we'll be disappointed. Or we might start to get anxious about whether we're going to be able to continue to get them in the future. So Epicurus's advice is that we keep our physical pleasures very simple and we enjoy the tranquility that comes from knowing that we're always going to be able to secure those. So we don't need to worry about the future in quite the same way that we might have beforehand. Okay, so to kind of summarize the, the, um, the, the key ideas, um, Epicurus is going to argue then that we don't actually need that many material things in order to live a good life. And in particular, knowing that we don't need that many material things is going to reduce our anxiety about the future. And then secondly, um, avoiding pain is more important than pursuing pleasure, he'll argue. It's that static pleasure that's more important than active pleasure. It's not about enjoying fancy meals at fine restaurants. It's about not being hungry. That's the thing that really matters. And finally, it's actually mental or psychological pleasures and pains that are far more significant than physical ones. I mean, we all deal with physical pain from time to time, whether we, you know, whether it be toothache or stubbing our toe or backache or whatever it might be. And none of these things are pleasant. And on the terms of Epicure Epicurus's hedonism, they're genuinely bad things, right? But they pass fairly quickly. They don't destroy the quality of your life as a whole. Um, but psychological pain, anxiety, distress, worry about the future, those are things that can colour the quality of someone's entire life and really um, inhibit their ability to enjoy a good life. So focusing on those psychological pleasures and pains is far more important than worrying about um, the physical pleasures that we might associate with crude hedonism. And right at the end of his life, when Epicurus is dying, he writes a letter to one of his friends. He's, he's quite seriously ill. He's, he's really suffering. Um, he's, he's suffering real physical pain. Um, and again, on the terms of his own philosophy, that's a genuinely bad thing. Um, pain is, physical pain remains a genuinely bad thing, he, he'll, he'll say. But in this letter to one of his friends, he says, well, I am suffering real physical pain, but I can offset that with psychological pleasures. And in particular, as he writes to this old friend, he says, well, I've got the memories of all of those wonderful conversations that we've had in the past. And by reflecting on all those wonderful conversations we've had, that gives me real pleasure. And that psychological pleasure can outweigh the physical pain that I'm having to deal with at the moment. And so overall, I'm still living a pleasant life. Okay, so to, to wrap things up, the last thing I'd like to say is the role that philosophy plays in all of this. One thing that Epicurus and Lucretius are quite adamant about is that philosophy is absolutely essential in order for us to live well. We need philosophy because by understanding the way the world works, we can remove those superstitious beliefs that uh, might generate anxiety in us. And by using philosophy to think about the nature of what's good, what's bad, what's pleasant, um, what's painful, what it is we really do and do not need in order to live well, that's gonna help us enormously too. So we need philosophy. Philosophy is fundamental, Epicurus thinks. 
And Lucretius in his great poem says that as such, it's the single most important human creation. It's the most important thing that humans have developed throughout their history. And in one great moment, Lucretius says, the invention of philosophy is more important even the, than the invention of farming, right? Of all of the world historic events in the history of humanity, surely the invention of farming is one of the most significant moments when we shift from being nomadic um, hunter-gatherers to um, uh, uh, settled communities. But Lucretia says, no, philosophy is more important than that. And I think one of the things that's going on here is the thought that there's no image, although Epicurus is suggesting a, uh, a very modest, simple life, you might imagine that he, he, he thinks that modern civilization is, if you like, um, overcomplicated life and we ought to go back to a simpler past time. And he is suggesting that we go back to a simpler time in terms of thinking about our needs, but not a simpler time intellectually. So for Epicurus and Lucretius, there's no image of a, of a lost um, age in which everything was perfect and noble savages free from the corruptions of modern civilization were perfectly happy. Lucretius is quite insistent that earliest human beings would have been riddled by superstition. They would have been fearful of thunder. They would have worshipped the god as a son. They would have engaged in all sorts of su superstitious activities, worried about um, a, a physical phenomena that they didn't really understand. And that those early human beings would have been unable to live a happy life. It's only once we've got a proper understanding of nature and we can escape those superstitious beliefs that we're able really to live happily and gain the sort of con psychological contentment that Epicurus is suggesting. So on the one hand, it's a very modest, simple life that he's describing, but it's one that is intellectually sophisticated because it requires this proper understanding of nature and our place within it. And I will stop there. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, John. That was absolutely fascinating. Bear in mind, John's book, The Fourfold Remedy, Epicurus and the Art of Happiness is available. So when you want to find out more from this talk, that's where you go. Um, we've got Q&A now. So anybody who would like to answer a question, please type it in and I'll uh, come to you in order. You can ask John questions. I'd like to start with one actually, because I was interested in Epicurus um, list of, uh, of things we need in their categorization. And it strikes me that uh, status is something that seems to be fairly hardwired into human beings, but it causes us a great deal of distress because we do get un the desire for unnecessary and unnatural things. Um, designer clothes would be a good example. Nobody needs designer clothes. Uh, what would you have to say about dealing with the need for status? Um, yes, that's a good question. I mean, well, I mean, Epicurus is going to be quite insistent that we we ought not to worry about that at all. There's a, um, a, a very sort of famous Epicurean maxim that a number of, of sources report, which simply two words, and it says, live unnoticed, right? So the, 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 the happy life um, of contentment um, isn't interested in, 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 in making a public show. It isn't interested in uh, clamoring for the opinions of others. And I think we see that in the fact that the Epicureans gather together in this private community. They, they create a little community in their garden of like-minded people. Another thing that Epicurus talks about a lot is friendship and the importance of our relationships with other people. But he describes it as a kind of a mutual support network where you have 
um, uh, two friends or a group of friends who support each other and help each other out um, in a very practical way, right? Your anxiety about the future is reduced if you know you've got a friend that you can turn to in times of need. And likewise, their anxiety is reduced if they know they can turn to you. That's a very different type of social relationship to the one we might think of when we think about sort of our public reputation and our status, where we're just trying to impress other people, which is a very, obviously, a, a, um, a far more super, superficial relationship. So absolutely, we want to use that analysis to show that we ought, in fact, not to worry about status at all. So live unnoticed, perhaps that's something that we should tell potential X Factor contestants for their psychological well-being. Well, I think our first question is from Rona. Um, so let me take a look at Rona's, uh, there we go. Do you? Ah. Can you can you speak, Rona? Oh, there we go. Let me just find her. Um, it's uh, uh. sorry, it's taking a while. Uh, Rona specifically asked if she could answer this question herself. So I don't want to just go over it's a good question i don't want to just um speak over her here we go i'm just about to allow you to talk rona so unmute your microphone and ask john your question hello can you hear me yes we can hello hello rona hello can you hear me yes hello ah, you can hear me oh. good okay mm -hmm. um i just want to say um yeah, uh, just just a, a, a sort of reference to the status um, the status question that you asked. Um, I pursued a recording career when I was young, and it didn't work out um, for a variety of reasons. But I'm a lot happier now than I was because it turns out that I became um, quite physically disabled, and now I uh, do a lot of performing and singing online. And uh, the shows that I do, I do within the context of my physical limitations. And I'm much happier now than I would have been if I had been a successful recording artist. So I think things do work out for the best in the end. And I, I definitely agree with you about do not pursue status and live unnoticed. Uh, but I do have a question about um, the uh, uh, what is what is uh, what is terrible um, can be easily endured. I think that was the last the last category you addressed, John, uh, about what is terrible can be easily endured. Um, I think that human beings are much more complex that we, we understand the human condition a lot more than we would have done in, in, in ancient Greek times. And although there were things like slavery and, and, and uh, exploitation of um, human labor that would have existed then, I think um, these days we have an understanding of things like domestic abuse, child abuse, um, trafficking. Um, you know, we have uh, a much more, uh, you know, clearer understanding of things like PTSD, for example. So um, I would argue that what is terrible may have been more endurable in 300 BC, but I think these days we know that what is terrible leaves permanent psychological and emotional scars on people in terms of what, how they behave going forward. If a, per a person is abused in childhood, it will affect their personality moving forward. It will affect their relationships with others. It will affect how they choose to live, the choices that they make in terms of self-preservation. They may end up uh, an addictive personality. They may end up sabotaging themselves. They may end up homeless. They, they may end up with not enough for their basic needs. They may end up suicidal because they, okay. they cannot mm -hmm. cope with what is terrible, uh, what, what they can't endure it. So uh, how would you sort of address, address that? How would you address uh, that in terms of modern day 21st century um, human psychology? Thanks, Rona. Uh, yes, thank you. So I think that that line, what's terrible is easy to endure. I mean, in context, what he's referring to there is um, physical pain rather than the sort of psychological trauma that you're describing. So he thinks that um, we're actually much better at coping with physical pain than we might 
uh, think. So I think that that's what it's referring to there. I mean, obviously, I hope what's come through from the talk is that Epicurus is primarily concerned with psychological pain. He thinks psychological pain of the sort, you know, of the sorts that you're describing and many others is precisely, as you so eloquently put, the thing that can colour and destroy the quality of someone's entire life. And so that's the thing that we really do need to pay attention to. Um, so in that sense, I think that he would he would agree with you that these are the things that are, uh, those are the sorts of things that are most important that we need to attend to. Um, in terms of the, the 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 text that we've got, there's not a there's unsurprisingly not a huge amount of discussion of of how to cope with that kind of sort of child childhood trauma, for instance. I mean, I suppose the only thing I would say off the top of my head is um, I mentioned towards the end the idea that we try to sort of focus our attention on the present moment and live on the present moment and don't be overly anxious about the future. I suppose you could say that equally we perhaps ought not to dwell too much on the past. Now, I don't mean to say don't dwell on the past as a kind of glib response to someone who suffered some horrific abuse in, in the past, but the, I think that would be the kind of the focus of, of, of direction, that if we can sort of focus on living in the present moment rather than um, um, reliving things that have happened in the past, um, that might be a kind of a, an Epicurean reply. Thanks, John. It's interesting because that's actually the kind of cognitive behavioural modern psychological approach as well, isn't it? not to try and analyse the hell out of things, but try and help people to stop ruminating. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to keep their questions really short because John's talk is really, really popular and we've got loads of you wanting to ask questions. The next person is Richard Francis. So if you can switch your microphone on, Richard, I'm allowing you to talk now. Are you there? Yep. Hello. Uh, hello, you. hello there. Uh, thank you very much for a really good talk. I just wanted to ask, um, Epicurus seems to, or obviously says that uh, philosophy is the most important thing. Uh, should a broad understanding of philosophy be taught in all schools at all ages, uh, you know, actually put into the national curriculum? Uh, and how would we do this? Because it, it seems such a vital thing in this very complicated age. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I mean, absolutely. I certainly think that that would be um, uh, a, a great thing to do. There's, um, I mean, it can certainly be done. There are people out there that do philosophy for children. Um, there's a great organisation in London called the um, Philosophy Foundation. I think Peter Worley and, and others have been doing great work teaching philosophy to children. Um, small children are all natural philosophers, aren't they? Right? They all ask why about everything. So the, they already are philosophers. Um, and so to give them some guidance and training into, uh, into how to reflect on these questions, um, absolutely, um, that would be, uh, I, th I think that's absolutely essential. Uh, and the next question is from Jen. Are you there, Jen? Hello, Jen. Okay, because Jen doesn't appear to be there just at the moment, um, she said, can you comment on the similarities or not between the philosophers and the explosion of modern day personal development experts? Um, I'm not sure I know what a personal development expert is. I suppose it's sort of those, um, all of those self-help books where you are, quite a lot of them refer to ancient philosophy, but probably not in particularly good depth, but uh, just, yeah. you know, how to, to improve your life, how to make everything better for yourself. I mean, I think I suppose the key difference would be that the Epicureans, and this would apply to the Stoics as well, that um, I've worked on, will suggest all sorts of things that they think will improve your, your life. But they're never going to say, just believe these things or do these things because we think it will make you feel better or make you more effective or whatever it might be. They'll say, do these things and believe these things because we think they're true. And we're going to give you some arguments for why we believe they're true. And so you should only accept them if you buy the arguments, right? So there's a foundation in truth and there are arguments made for every single claim. So 
the Epicureans will give us a whole series of arguments for why they think we ought to end up with their, their conclusion. And either you follow the arguments or you don't. Whether, the, whether you think, I mean, sometimes people will say, oh, I don't like that particular philosophy because it doesn't look attractive to me. And it's like, well, who cares whether you think it looks attractive? Is it based on truth? And, and that's the, the big claim that the Epicureans are gonna make. We think we've understood how nature really is. And on the basis of that, we think that this is what's gonna enable you to live a good life. Okay, next one is from Chris Nichols. Are you there, Chris? Hello, Chris. Hello, Chris Nichols. I've unmuted you. Perhaps Chris has um, popped off to the shops. Uh, he said, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, Epicureanism sounds very Buddhist to me, living modestly, um, present moment awareness, that sort of thing. Um, do you have anything to say, John, about the similarity that he sees? Um, Yes, I mean, I think, I mean, I think that's understandable to see that, see that connection, um, and other people have noted that as well. Um, in fact, one of the things I think is really striking is there are there are three sort of um, famous schools of philosophy active in this period. There are the Epicureans, and as I say, there's this live in the present moment, live a live a modest life, um, uh, focus on removing psychological distress. The Stoics are around at the same time. And again, people have often noticed similarities between the Stoics and the Buddhists. And then the third group of philosophers acting in this period were known as the Peronians, who are skeptics, who thought that the key to living a, a happy, tranquil life is to believe nothing at all, um, escape all belief. And the founder of Pyrrhonism, Pyrrho, actually traveled to India with Alexander the Great and is reported to have met various Indian wise men. And so there's a literature on how all three of the schools of philosophy that were active in Athens in this period have similarities or potential historical connections with Buddhism. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what's going on there. And, and obviously Buddhism is developing around the same time in India. So there, is, there are a whole range of parallels that's, that are really quite striking. In the case of Pyramid... Perhaps we sorry, um, perhaps we underestimate how much the ancients were able to speak to each other. Possibly. I mean, as I say, there, there may have been some connection between Pyrrho and um, the Buddhists. Um, I don't think there's any line of influence between Epicurus and the Buddhists, or the Stoics for that matter. Um, a lot of Epicurus's ideas uh, are developed out of ideas that are already earlier in the Greek tradition, from Democritus in particular, who was also an atomist, and also had lots of ideas about the importance of tranquility. And the Stoics are building on ideas from earlier Greek philosophers as well. So I think they're homegrown, but I think that there are a, a range of, of points of similarity for sure. Okay, next there's one from um, Laurie Hulker. Are you there, Laurie? Can we hear you, Laurie? You should unmute, apparently. I'm getting a... I'm getting a warning there. Hello, Laurie. Okay, Laurie asked, is there an extent to which Epicureanism can be linked to an aesthetic lifestyle? Aesthetic lifestyle. Yes, I mean, I think so. I mean, I'm describing it, uh, describing a very modest life um, of, um, uh, of um, fairly simple pleasures. Maybe not as... It, it, it's, I mean, it's a tricky question. Maybe not ascetic in the sense of denying yourself pleasures, right? Because Epicurus certainly thinks that physical pleasure is something that's genuinely good. So you might not desire, um, you, you might not deny yourself all pleasures, but you might resist all sorts of pleasures where they might generate future pain for you in the future, right? So you would avoid excess because you wouldn't want to suffer you, um, 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 physical pains that that might produce, right? You don't overeat because you don't want to have indigestion. You don't want to drink too much because you don't want the hangover. So you do a, what's often referred to as hedonistic calculus. You work out what the pleasure might be versus the anticipated pains in the future that it might generate. 
So you do that. But then there's also that point about psychological pain. So you don't want to indulge too much if that's going to make you um, feel anxious about whether you can continue to indulge at that level in the future. So perhaps the word I would use is modest rather than ascetic. Um, but, but even so, it's a striking contrast to our usual image of hedonism, which we think would be a life of excess. William Kavanagh is next. Are you there, William? Hello? You've been unmuted, William. Ah, oh, William's left the room as well, which is a great shame because it's a very good question. It seems that Epicurus, Epicurus and his philosophy were almost entirely censored out of existence in late antiquity. And it's fortunate that some of his teachings survive only through Lucretius. Um, could you describe a little more of how this came about, William wants to know? Yeah, sure. So uh, it's a good question. Um, so in late antiquity, um, absolutely, Epicureanism sort of drifts off, off the table a little bit. Um, Platonism dominates. And of course, we have the rise of Christianity. And then in someone like Augustine, um, you get someone who brings together elements from Platonism and Christianity. And the materialist Epicureans preaching a life of pleasure is obviously anathema to that kind of worldview, um, which often really is ascetic. Um, so Epicureanism really um, um, falls off the map in the Middle Ages. Um, in the early Renaissance, um, a, um, um, uh, a, a, a cardinal in the Vatican, who's also a humanist and a book hunter, uh, finds a copy of Lucretius in a monastery in southern Germany and rescues it and sends it to his friends in Florence, who then feverishly copy it out and this, the text starts to circulate. Um, as it happens, that manuscript that was found has since been lost. Um, and, but there are two other early copies that we have. So basically, Lucretius survived the Middle Ages in just three copies, one of which is now gone. So there are just two copies from the ninth century that survive. Um, so as with the survival of much of, of classical literature, it's a story of horrible contingency where it's just by chance that things have survived. And then all okay. the other texts, that, uh, many of the other texts that we got for Lucretius, that's, that's for Epicurus that survive, survive within another book. So a book by Diogenes Laertius called The Lives of the Philosophers, um, which has lots of information about lots of different Greek philosophers. And Diogenes Laertius was himself probably an Epicurean because the final book of his work, book 10, which is the culmination, is devoted to Epicurus. And in that, he copies out in full three letters that Epicurus wrote. And those are our main sources of Epicurus's own philosophy that, that he copies out. So they survive kind of within this other work that's brought from Byzantium to Italy in the 15th century and then starts to circulate. And in, again, the, um, a monk in the 15th century uh, is about to tra is, uh, uh, translates Diogenes Laertius into Latin so that people can read it more widely. And when he gets to book 10 and he gets to the Epicurean bit, he's really quite hesitant of translating this into Latin because he thinks it's full of all of these dangerous, potentially heretical ideas that shouldn't go into public circulation although eventually he, he gives in and does it. Good, I, I'm glad that movement happened because there's an awful lot of grim stuff in Christianity which did ultimately come from Plato, isn't it? It's sort of blighted a thousand years, really. Um, uh, so now we have Benedict Clark. Are you there? We're going to carry on having difficulties or are you there, Benedict? Let us know if you're there. I think I will now leave. I am here, can you hear me? Fantastic, good. Can you ask oh, your... <laughs> Yeah, sure. So uh, thanks for the talk. It's really interesting. Um, I'm interested particularly in this idea that we don't actually need much because it seems to me that that runs quite contradictory to the sort of narrative that we're told in the Western democracies and really how, you know, the entire structure of those societies is built. So I suppose I wonder, do we really need to start reassessing how our economic models and work and how our structures, societies are structured if we want to allow contentment to flourish? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And uh, I mean, I think, I think absolutely yes. 
Um, I mean, if you think about the, the environmental problems that have been caused by runaway consumerism, um, I think you could, you could tell a story in which you might say that this kind of suggestion that we focus on what's absolutely essential and we keep our, our physical, um, uh, our desires for physical things um, uh, in check is something that's going to be absolutely fundamental if we're going to reduce the levels of emissions and consumption that are currently doing so much damage to the environment. And obviously, as you rightly say, that's going to involve a, a radical change to the way in which we tend to think. And our you know, current governments uh, remain completely obsessed on growth. Right? Growth and more consumption and more economic activity is always presented as the panacea for everything. But just from an environmental point of view, you know, that could be our destruction. I think Epicurus does offer a framework to, um, to challenge that. Um, just as an aside, Karl Marx was a keen reader of Epicurus in his youth. Karl Marx's doctoral dissertation was written on Epicurean atomism, and he was originally drawn to Epicureanism precisely because it was materialist, right, and it was attacking superstition, and so that was very much in tune with where he was at that point. Um, but again, you can see um, from the point you've raised about the ethics that um, uh, encouraging a life that doesn't involve excessive consumption might have chimed with some of Marx's later um, thoughts as well. And the next one is from Pete M. Ah, Pete M. Apparently you are using an older version of Zoom. So I have to promote you to panellist. I tell you what, I'll just ask your question on your behalf and then you can download Zoom a bit later. Uh, what Pete asked was instead of the word philosophy, uh, should we not use the more modern meaning, which is science? And he means that specifically in the statement about philosophy being more important than farming. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So obviously, when we're using the word philosophy in antiquity, we're using it in a very broad sense to include natural philosophy and so science, uh, science as well, we might say. But I take it that the Epicureans would say that when they're talking about philosophy being the most important invention, they're not just talking about science, they're also talking about ethics. So understanding the way the world works to avoid superstition is part of the reason why philosophy is so important, but it's also that kind of ethical analysis of what is it that we need to live a good life? What has value? What's most important to us? Those sorts of ethical reflections that these days we'd still think very much part of philosophy and not science are also going to be part of the picture. So yes, a, a broad conception of philosophy, but, but not simply science. Next question is from John Dowdle. Um, can you unmute John so that you can ask your question? At the moment you're muted. It's a little button just at the bottom left hand side. Never mind, I'll ask on your behalf. Uh, John says, were the Epicureans supported by slaves and were they considered to be of a higher social class than the working class Greeks? Um, that's a good question. And I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head what Epicurus's own attitude or relationship to slavery was. Obviously, lots and lots of otherwise admirable people in the ancient world are, are somewhat tainted by, <laughs> um, uh, 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 by that. So I'm not entirely sure, uh, to be honest. One thing I would say is that if we think about the Roman context, I mentioned um, Lucretius and Philodemus possibly being in the Bay of Naples. Um, they may have known Virgil and Horace, the Roman poets, both of whom also had strong Epicurean sympathies. Um, I think in that context, there, there certainly would have been an unthinking reliance on slavery, um, which, you know, um, yeah, is far from ideal. It's like an awful lot of um, monks and nuns in the Middle Ages writing these incredibly virtuous works and living virtuous lives, but they had to buy their way into that lifestyle. They were terribly middle class or aristocratic people. Um, the next one is Helen Cross. Are you there, Helen? I'm just finding you. Don't worry. There we go. You can speak, Helen. 
if you can get going. Hello, yes, thank you. Um, I was okay. Yeah, I was wondering whether Epicureanism says anything about whether we should or could um, try to advance the happiness and contentment of other people rather than just our own happiness. Um, yes, that's a good question. So I take it Epicurus would say that everything that he's doing in promoting this philosophy is in order to help other people, right? He's trying to show people the ways in which um, they can overcome their own psychological um, anxieties and so live, live a better life. So there's a sense in which, um, in that sense, he's trying to promote the happiness of others. Um, and earlier I said a little bit about the role of friendship and in his discussion of friendship, that's all about how friends might help each other out uh, and benefit each other both practically, um, but also by remove, removing some of our concern about the future because we've know, we know that we've got other people out there that we can rely on. So friendship and relationship with other people, I think is really important to the Epicureans. Um, Okay, and we have one from Michael Granville. Uh, again, um, you again, Michael. Unfortunately, you're using an older version of Zoom, so you should download that in, as soon as you finish listening to us. He, the question he's asked is: I did Lucretius at school many years ago, and rediscovered it in the book *The Swerve* by Michael Greenblatt. Uh, if you know this book, do you recommend it? Um. Yes, the, the Greenblatt's book, The Swerve. So I'll say one positive thing about it and then one negative thing about it. So I read it, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a great read. Um, and it tells the kind of detective story of how Lucretius's tech was discovered by that cardinal in the monastery in, um, uh, uh, in the 15th century, and then how the how the, the, the text went from there. So it's a great read and I love those sorts of stories about, you know, people hunting for books and finding them in, uh, and so on. So I'd recommend it in that sense. Um, the only criticism I'd make of it is right at the very end, he makes a very grandiose claim that it was the rediscovery of Lu Lucretius that basically caused the Renaissance and caused the Enlightenment and caused everything, right? Which kind of oversells it a little bit, I think. And um, academic reviewers have said that that's just far too grand a claim to make. So I think the final chapter perhaps overstates the, the influence of Lucretius, but the story he tells about the recovery of the text um, is really nicely told. And so I think I'd recommend it for people as a good read. John, that's been an absolutely fascinating talk. Thank you ever so much. And uh, remember that uh, John's book is available. It goes into all of this in a great deal more detail. It is The Fourfold Remedy, so um, you can get that. Is that out now, John, or is it later in the year? No, that's out now. It came out at the beginning of the month. Fantastic. OK. And before we all stop this session, I'd like to remind everybody that Conway Hall is suffering as much as everybody else is um, in these very peculiar times. And if you've managed to carry on working throughout this time and you've got a little bit of extra money in the bank, if you could make a donation to help us keep doing the work that we do, then that would be very, very much appreciated. Meanwhile, I would, the last thing I'd like to say is thank you ever so much to John for an absolutely fascinating talk. And thank you to the contributors for their questions as well. It really is good when you get the whole subject sort of more live when you, you get the, uh, the questions coming in. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you for having me.